Rolling. Everybody can please start heading to your seats so you can get started. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning for the third annual Innovation in Healthcare Conference. Today's theme, as you may have heard, is Community Dialogue for in Innovating Our Future. And it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Rob McRae. Rob McRae is the President and CEO of Wireless Life Sciences Alliance and Chairman of the Board of the Alliance Healthcare Foundation. Rob has dedicated himself to the creation of financial opportunities and public health improvements through increasing the collaboration among key players, including multiple scientific and medical disciplines, investors, healthcare organizations, investor-owned companies, and nonprofit foundations. So with that, I will hand it over to Rob and wishing everybody a great day today. Good morning. Um, great to see you here. And um, we apologize for the late start. Um, a lot of people that are RSVP haven't made it here yet, so we have a normal number, so maybe they'll be trickling in. So thank you for your patience. And um, so I'm just going to get things started off. We have some good, great content uh, this morning, and then um, the interactive aspects of today uh, will take up most of the time, and I think that is the most important part of today because uh, we have great problems um, in this country and in this community. Uh, and um, managing and maintaining and improving the health and status of our citizens. We're all focused uh, in this room on uh, those who are most vulnerable, of course, and uh, their challenges are increasing as rapidly as that of the general population. But I, we believe that the answers are within this room, within this community, uh, but they can be found in solutions that improve the way that we deliver care, that we, the way that we manage the health of our citizens. Those solutions exist within this room, within the community, that by using the tools that are available to us, that are being created by others, we, you can find ways to improve um, the status of the individuals that we are really concerned with. Um, I didn't expect really much of an introduction except here's Rob, who's the chairman. And, um, but I do spend um, really all my professional time now bringing together organizations and people who don't normally work together. And I think that in the safety net community that is just as important. So I'm just going to make a few comments here to get things going and then introduce our executive director who will take you through uh, the rest of the day. So, um, some of you have heard this before, but Alliance Healthcare Foundation Board, about three years ago, started addressing kind of the core issue that we had a demand curve for services that is increasing far faster than the resources, the financial resources, um, were increasing. And so we had a fundamental problem light and gap in need and uh, capability or capacity. So how can we address that? And um, our conclusion was that we all had to, in our organization and in the community that we can influence, have to promote ways of looking for better, more efficient approaches to utilizing available resources in order to create solutions for more of the need. So within our own organization, we streamlined our processes, uh, we reduced our overhead, and that enabled us to free up more dollars for grants. We created the innovation uh, initiative. Uh, we have some of the 
winners on these poster boards here behind me, and um, committed up to a million dollars per year to that program. Um, we streamlined our grant making process, created the mission support grant program with kind of micro applications to reduce the burden on our grantees, and but get dollars out into um, into the community to organizations that embrace this uh, core strategy and belief that we have, and that is that you have to be more creative, more collaborative, more efficient in order to stretch the resources to meet more of the demand. So that's what we support in there. Um, and so that's what we do internally now. We are trying, and our, our kind of major initiative is to enhance the uh, community that includes all of you, others in the county and outside the county who are dedicated to the mission of improving the health and wellness of the vulnerable populations in our region. So uh, I have just a, a few images to, to share with you. So the first is that we're not alone. This is just a headline. Um, if anyone thinks that things might get better, if more federal dollars will flow, more state dollars will flow, it is not going to happen. We have to just embrace that, know it. Uh, we're not going to get more dollars. Uh, we are going to stabilize, we hope, and make, have to make better use of what we have. Well, that's not a good amount at all. Maybe an Apple to Microsoft um, problem. So I'll just tell you what those are. Um, so the, um, the bottom curve, the red line, that's the growth of physician population over the next uh, eight years or so. The green line is the growth of the general population. And the yellow line is the growth of population age 65 and above. And all of you who are in healthcare know the, the significance of that because as we get older, we get sicker. As we get sicker, we make more demand. And um, we aren't going to have enough physicians or other clinicians, uh, certainly physicians, trained and available to keep doing things the same way we are now. Um, healthcare is spending on, we're spending more per capita um, nationally and internationally. Um, as the chronic disease rises with age dramatically, each of the white bars is under 45, and the dark bars are aging population and the number of chronic diseases that we have. Um, so, demographics in the general population is driving demand, uh, as well as you know, wealth and increasing income dis disparity that we have in this country. Um, and yet, you know, two thirds of uh, one of the key therapies that we use, prescriptions, aren't being used. Um, and that's a communication problem. So um, we have some tools that weren't available even 10 years ago. Uh, this is an image of connectivity on Facebook around the world. This is the cover of the magazine, and um, simply makes the point that you know, PC, personal computers, PCs, aren't the key way to communicate with people now. Um, it's the cell phone, and I'm sure everybody here has one. Um, some of you have more than one. But more to the point, um, the world's population, including populations that we are focused on here in, in our region um, almost universally have a cell phone. There's six billion cell phone subscribers around the world out of the total population of seven billion. In this country there's more than 100 percent coverage of cell phones, which means that 15 or 17 percent of people have you know, more than one. And so we have a way now that didn't exist just 10 years ago to communicate.
it in virtually every beneficiary that we want, and we can do it efficiently. And those phones aren't just voice and text, but increasingly they are smartphones, so they are actually small PCs in, in your pocket or handbag. Um, if you read the newspaper, if you read any of the trade, as you know that there's lots of buzz around M-Health and mobile health and connected health and wireless health and digital health and electronic health. And the only reason I threw this slide in here, which colors are really odd again, is um, because you aren't alone. So sometimes I think in dealing with you know, those of, of us and people who are focused on um, serving kind of the safety net, um, think, well, we're one and no one cares about us, but the, the world of uh, business, of education, of research is focused on us, partially because this is such an important national and international problem, and partially because health and healthcare have been embraced as a topic, as a focal point, by um, young people all around the world. And that's bringing new energy uh, and research and, and social innovation uh, to the field. And, and those are all creating resources that are available to you in trying to answer our call to be you know, innovative in your thinking and creating solutions to the problems that we want to address. So, just as examples of some of the resources, this was an announcement between IBM and WellPoint to use machine learning as a way of providing clinical decision support and helping with the, the problem. There's much more medical knowledge available than any physician, any clinic, any hospital, any single institution can possibly stay on top of at any given time. Uh, this is just an example of one of many uh, efforts in that regard to make this knowledge more accessible and cheaper to access. Another one, sign of change, United Health Group, the big HMO, has gone into the hearing aid business, but it's doing so, it's done so by taking a wonderful technology and offering it at a price about 50% less than and commercially available uh, devices. Uh, and just taking advantage of the cost curve of technology. So that's a, that's a nice sign, it's not a panacea, it's a nice sign though. It's just an indication of what's going on in the community that helps us. Um, a few examples of life for, there's an ECG, I have one on the back of my iPhone here. Um, this is a device, clinical grade ECG, it doesn't require all the equipment in a clinic or a hospital, obviously, but um, it is clinical grade uh, information. It's very simple, but the main thing is, this is just an example. This will sell for well under $100, which um, is an example of how devices, um, the device industry is starting to take advantage of the cost curve that we've enjoyed in the consumer electronics space, where over time, our devices, our televisions, for example, get better and cheaper over time, very rapidly. In healthcare, of course, the curve tends to be just going in the opposite direction. So we're starting to get that, the benefits of the consumer electronics industry in healthcare. And this is one, one example. Another one is telecare. Um, that device is a blood glucose meter uh, with a uh, cell chip, cellular chip. You don't have to have a subscription to get it, just a, it's a bundle. And uh, what that does is it automates the collection of uh, the data from the meter, connects it with a coaching platform, the feedback platform, with a monitoring platform. This is on the, on the market in the U.S. And, and abroad now. So it enables uh, oversight and management, it enables higher compliance, 
But again, I just throw these out as examples of what the, what industry is doing because 10 years ago, this wasn't happening. 10 years ago, it was electronic procedures and everyone kind of focused on building more expensive devices that were really good for the well-insured and the wealthy. It didn't work for everyone else. And these devices are all focused on broader markets, especially the international markets, which are self-pay and therefore look a lot like populations that we are serving here. I mentioned prescription compliance. This is a simple uh, system that replaces the cap on the traditional prescription bottle, connects through a, a nightlight hub, just a device. It is a nightlight. You plug it into your wall, so it's as simple installation as that, and that provides connectivity for this device, for these caps, again, to a back-end platform that manages compliance. It can take through the lights to alert the patient. It's time to take your next med. And it allows tracking, automated tracking of compliance. So to the extent you're in healthcare and you know that you know, sometimes you can identify a therapy, but it doesn't get carried out because as soon as that individual leaves your clinic, they revert to their normal behavior and they're forgetful, or et cetera. We are now giving the tools, you are planning the tools that are coming, or that are in the market now, that will um, that you can take advantage of. Um, iTriage um, is, a, uh, is a platform for um, you know, direct-to-consumer screening that helps them determine, um, do I need to go the doctor, do I need to go to the emergency room? It's unfortunately a good back end. It's been diverted and used a little too much for it as a referral um, approach now, but you know that's appropriate in some circumstances. But again, it's, it's an example and it's free. So you can use it for free right now. So those are examples of some of what Thomas is doing now. Let me just take a couple of minutes on innovation and then I'll be done because I want to say this, and we've talked about this before, but innovation from a line software's perspective does not have to be about technology. It may be about a different way of solving a problem. And that's fundamentally what, what innovation is. You have a problem, come up with a way to solve that problem. If it is a technology-enabled service, so much the better. You certainly have to use those when they're available. But it may be a change in workflow. It may be a change in um, educational approaches. And um, I, uh, the Blue Zone book, this is an examination of four communities around the world, uh, four, uh, four of the five being in very poor um, areas where people live the longest. And it's an examination of why they do. And it's, it's, in fact, it's mostly cultural and dietary. What we call lifestyle, think of lifestyle choices, they just go where they are. So I encourage you, know, you to, to think and look at things outside our normal routine and looking for ideas and approaches. Um, we've cited this one a lot. Uh, this is a tool of um, review of uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Brenner's work in Camden, New Jersey, um, where he's faced with overwhelming, overwhelmed grief in, uh, hospital resources and um, you know, using only you know, database solutions to identify individuals who uh, really needed much more care and utilizing much more expensive services than, than average where to focus traditional support services, um, who to work with, and then they're out, out working on how to keep these individuals, divert them from yet another trip to the emergency room or that yet another inpatient stay. And uh, we have organizations in this in county that are, that are bringing this thing in here. So this is innovative in, in our perspective. Um, this is the cover of um, a report from the California Healthcare Foundation. That's the Oakland-based nonprofit 
that is uh, like us, but about 20 times larger. They are focused on uh, the challenge, the health of challenge populations in all of California. One of the services that they provide are excellent reports on um, the convergence of technology and healthcare with a focus on uh, the population that we're worried about. So I commend their research. All of this is free. And that's the wonderful thing. That New Yorker article I just showed you. I mean, one thing about the digital age, it has made information free. And I would, I would leave you with the notion that in healthcare, um, as I said, I believe the solution to our problem and is really in this room. But I encourage you to recognize that one of the key attributes of digital information, when you bring that into health, so think of digital health, is to um, knock down the barriers, make more transparent the really opaque world of healthcare. Right now, knowledge is locked up in the hands of doctors and nurses, and patients feel like they have to rely completely on someone else to do it. But what will happen, what is happening in the digital age in every field, is that the consumer becomes more knowledgeable. And when the consumer becomes more knowledgeable, he or she can make better decisions and have more control. And with that control comes a better service. Um, there's no perfect metaphor. Health is a unique issue. But the, these societal and technology traits are going to have that with you. So um, from my perspective, because I, I you know, look at a lot of different areas, um, the country, world, where innovation is occurring, and uh, we have resources, so I just encourage you, when you're thinking about how to respond to our calls for applications, and in the general work to you know, look outside the community, look outside the normal information sources, and you will find sources of inspiration and tools to, um, to serve your mission and, and achieve your goals. So with that, I will bring up uh, Nancy Sasaki, our executive director, and uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rob. Um, so as you know, as I've greeted some of you this morning, I have a really bad cold. And I was really hoping that when it hit me earlier this week, that it would either be gone by Friday, or I would have that really raspy, sexy voice, right? But no, I've got the head cold, really squeaky voice instead, so I apologize. But I'm really glad that all of y'all are here. I'm um, really happy to see you. And part of the technology, I wanted you to know that if you are on Twitter, you can find us live streaming. I can see myself right now. We are live streaming at hashtag AHF Innovation. So you can like Twitter along with it and say just, you know, how, well, you know, squeaky voice is good. Whatever, but we're really excited about we're using all of our technology. You can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter. Please be our friend, we like you, um, so please be our friend. Um, yeah, I've got to do this later. So, Rob talked a little bit about the history of the conference and that this is our third annual Innovation in Healthcare um, conference. And I just wanted to kind of go back over a little bit of the last three years. In 2010, there was probably a little bit more of a focus on the technology. We had the speaker from Google, but we also um, have each year wanted to present something new and different to you about what really plays into being innovative, what plays into in innovation in and of itself. And so part of it is technology, and that's what the first year was about. The second year, in 2011, was much more about social enterprise, and that's another tool in the toolbox for people to use in terms of ways to be innovative. It's like Rob said, there's not going to be any more government money coming in, we know that. So where else are we going to be able to find um, income and revenues that will help us continue the programs that we, that we love and are so important for the people that we serve? So social enterprise is one of those ways. This year, what we really, it's kind of a combination of two things. One is that, what you heard also when Rob was speaking, is that a lot of, we believe that the answer to a lot of these problems are truly in this room. They're also in the communities that you serve. And by having really strong, rich community dialogue, 
You can find out what the needs of the community are. You can innovate together. You can create the solutions together. So partly if you wanted to bring community dialogue to you is because we know it's in the community, but also because from the feedback of the last couple of years, that's something that each of you told us you wanted as well. You wanted the time to be able to network and talk about what's going on in the community, find new ways to create collaborations, and be able to kind of innovate and figure out what those solutions are. Um, so that's kind of the history of all of the things that we've been going um, presenting each of the last three years. Um, the other thing that we talk about and have learned over the past couple of years is, is different ways that nonprofits are bringing their innovative ideas forward to us. And um, when we were in one of the board meetings, we were talking about how um, we, you know, we really look for all of the components that are in a real business plan. And I told them the story that they thought would be interesting for me to share with you because it was kind of one of those, a funny thing happened on the way to the whatever, to my developing a business plan, or business plans 101. When I was at Planned Parenthood, we had this idea that we would do a training institute. That we thought that we could reduce the number of STIs, that we could reduce the unintended pregnancies, if we could broaden our reach with the education and training that we have available. And if we reached out to more physicians, pediatricians, and people that were in the medical profession and educated them about how to educate youth, that we would reach more youth than we reach right now, right? And that we could do the train the trainer, and we could provide CEUs, and the physicians would want to come and learn all about this and teach the kids that they have coming into their practice. And so I thought, you know, when I've been doing business plans before, watched them happen. Um, they usually had a panel of people that would give you feedback and tell you what you were doing right and what you needed to strengthen or things like that. So I got this guy that was a friend of, uh, of my parents that was a mergers and acquisitions guy. So this is what he does for a living, right? And I went in and I told him about our training institute and how it would reduce teen pregnancy and how it would reduce STIs and how we would reach the doctors and how it would be great and wonderful and, and all the numbers would drop and wouldn't that be great? And he kind of absolutely blew my presentation out of the water. I mean, blew it out of the water. And he made me, and, and I really got it in terms of the way nonprofits think. It's all about the goodness of what we do. That's what we love. That's why we're in the nonprofit world, right? It's because what the good happens to the people that we serve and how we see that we change their lives. That's who we are. That's why we get into the nonprofit world. And I, I was like, shocked when he said, so how many physicians do you have to reach at what cost before you can get a return on your investment? I was like, that's money. And then he said, how many, how many, where are you going to start? How, what, you know, like what connection do you already have with physicians that you can start small and then how are you going to know whether you're going to scale that up to reach more physicians or more nurse practitioners or what are your benchmarks for knowing that you've got to shut it down because it's not happening. And that, to me, shows, showed me the real difference. And I see Verna nodding her head because she's doing this with social enterprise and she's probably gotten the same kind of feedback. It is a different way of thinking. It is a really different way of looking at the problem from both the social um, aspect of it as well as the business aspect of it. And it's very different. And, and I laugh about it because my presentation at the end of the day looked so much different than when I first walked into that mergers and acquisitions guy. It really is kind of funny now. It wasn't then. I was very shocked. So um, one of the things that I've done is if you have at your table this flyer that talks about two webinars that I will be conducting, one a week from today and one a week and a half from today. One is Friday, one is I think on a Tuesday, one is in the afternoon and one is in the morning. So I hope that they are convenient times for you, but it will be an opportunity that I will go into the actual application process for the innovations grants and will give you much more detail about that sustainability piece, about the business piece, about the ROI, about all of those kinds of things. And you'll have an opportunity to ask me more questions directly as opposed to taking the time to walk through that today. Really want to get us into the community dialogue as soon as possible. Oh, I have a slide on that too. <laughs> Oh. Oh, there's, a, there's a webinar one. Okay, so um, 
As I mentioned before, we've gotten some of the feedback from you about wanting to have more of a community dialogue, and that's what we're doing today. The, the slide had a different date on the webinar, the April webinar. Yeah, the slide is right. I will not be doing this on a Sunday at 3.30. I'm sorry for that. It is April the 1st. Thank you for catching that. It is April the 3rd on a Tuesday. Okay, so what we really want to get to um, is much more of a, of a meaningful dialogue, and I hope that you will visit our exhibitors. There are a few coming at lunch as well, but there are, not only are there the past grantees that are innovative, but there's also going to be some exhibitors here that are examples of community dialogue and how they've brought community together to really be um, impactful and to make a difference in the community that they're serving. Um, so I am going to move us right along into Erica Winston. Um, I'd like to introduce her to you. She is the Senior Manager of Government Affairs for Qualcomm Incorporated and leads a team that manages healthcare, education, public safety, and environmental mobile technology projects. Qualcomm's Wireless Reach Initiative supports programs and solutions that bring the benefits of Qualcomm's connectivity to underserved communities worldwide. I think you're going to be very impressed with the kind of work that they are doing to advance health and wellness by working with communities around the world. There we go. Janet Joe, but <laughs> I don't. Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Nancy, and the Alliance Long Term Foundation for having me today. Um, as Nancy mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about wireless reach and initiative that we have at Qualcomm. And as I explain what we do, my hope is that our story will spark that will help you to do great work to advance healthcare and wellness in, uh, for those that are in need. And I'll touch upon a lot of the ideas that Rob and Nancy already introduced uh, today. So before I get into wireless reach, I need to explain a little bit about my company. Many of you know Qualcomm, but um, the core of our company about making wireless more personal, affordable, and accessible to everybody. Um, we specialize in making mobile phones and tablets more powerful and efficient and um, more useful tools in our daily lives. And it's not just using your phone for uh, voice connectivity and for texting, but it's really taking it to the next level as a competing device um, for more data rich activities. So that's what in a nutshell. It's a good business to be in. Um, the pervasiveness of the global cellular network is uh, incredible. By the end of this year, we're poised to have more cell phones in this world than we can have people. Um, so that's, that's our jumping off point. That's what we care about, mobile technology. It's great. Um, so while I say that, I mean, this, the, the contrast to that is that there still is a digital divide. I think mean, all of us are aware of this. 29% um, of the population in the world does not have access to internet connectivity. And, you know, if you look at the communities that are most in need, for example, women, um, women are a significant part of the population that don't have mobile phone access. Um, in fact, a woman in the developing world is 
21% like, less likely to have a cell phone than a male counterpart. Um, and when you think about developing country statistics, and I'll, I'll give a few more examples, you can also apply them to the communities that are most in need in developed countries, too. Why is that a problem? Um, there's been lots of information and lots of studies done about the impact of having um, technology. For example, the World Bank found that a 10% um, point increase in mobile penetration can be directly tied to um, an increase in GDP per capita of 28%, and then more compelling, as a result of having access to connectivity. Um, back to women. So women in particular can benefit from mobile services. Up to 41% of women business owners in developing countries report that increasing, that report that they increase their incomes or professional opportunities as a result of having their mobile phones. So the digital divide isn't just about you know, people not being able to call their moms. Um, it's also, <laughs> about being cut off from the tools that can make them successful in this economy. So this provides a little bit of the context for the Miles Richard issue, and I'll get into it in more detail. You know, global company dedicated to mobile technologies. It's our core competency. It's what we believe in. Um, it's how we make money. And this world where there's such a need so what we really wanted to do was work with the community, create an initiative where we would start addressing the needs of using our core competency. Um, so wireless reach is a strategic program that brings technology to understand communities globally. Um, and we do this by working with partners, and we invest in projects that foster entrepreneurship, aid in public safety, so we, um, enrich teaching and learning, improve environmental and it's relevant to you guys here today, um, we enhance the delivery of healthcare. And the partnerships that we work with, we engage with civil society, nonprofit organizations, universities, other private companies, um, governmental entities, and, and, um, and many other actually working types of organizations. And uh, we do uh, projects in over 30 countries and over 70 projects that we've done since when we started in 2006. So what I want to do is get into some of the examples so that um, you can see some of the work that we've done in partnership with organizations. Specifically, I will touch on the healthcare uh, project. So our healthcare projects can be roughly divided into some overlapping categories, um, enabling chronic disease management, empowering empowering elderly and disabled people, facilitating remote care and increasing efficiency. So I'll touch on some examples in the first three categories. So this is a project that's near and dear to my heart, and it's one that is very germane to this community. It's taking place in Tijuana, Mexico, with some of our esteemed partners here at the San Diego Nonprofit Community including um, the International Community Foundation. And uh, we've got Richard Kai and Sonia Contreras from ICF that are here with us today, and they, they will also be uh, around if you have more questions once I'm done. Um, you know, one of the things that we do with wireless reach is we start with the need. And um, according to the National Health Service survey, in less than four decades, diabetes has become the most prominent public health problem problem in the U.S.-Mexico border region, with more than 1.2 million people living with the condition. So um, what we wanted to do here is see how, um, and this is a theme through all of our projects, how mobile technology can be used specifically to you know, have a positive impact on this problem. Um, the partners include, as, as I mentioned, ICF and its sister organization in Mexico. Uh, the Scripps Whittier Diabetes Institute, uh, Fronteras Unidas Pro Salud, the Autonomous University of Baja California Medical and Medical School specifically, 
and uh, I used to sell, which is the, um, you can think of them as the Verizon of Mexico. So they're our operator partner. So basically what this project does is Scripps Whittier Diabetes Institute has started a program, and you may be familiar about it, with it called Project Lisa. It was a community-based approach that used promotoras to provide enhanced services to communities that were lacking in the access to, to more formalized clinical resources. They pioneered a program and a curriculum that they were proven to have success. What we wanted to do is take that bunch program that they've done here in, uh, in community, Latino communities and put it into place in Tijuana and we wanted to add the component of technology to it. And what, what, what could we do to enhance Project Dulce that, um, that could be helpful with patients having cell phones and promotoras having access to the information from the cell phones too. So basically, the project gives patients cell phones where they can access content. This, this content is multimedia rich, it's videos, it's images that help people understand what the symptoms look like when they have high or low blood sugar. Um, they also have an interactive survey component where the promotora is pushing them a survey and they're answering questions about how much um, tortillas, for example, they eat in a day, how um, much exercise they've gotten, what their blood glucose level is, and the promoters are able to get all that information on a daily basis. They're able to identify who is presenting uh, answers that are out of their normal range for that person. And they're also able to identify people that aren't answering the surveys and red flag those people as people that they will reach out to and make sure that they make contact with them. And that's just one of the aspects about how technology is being used in this project. And you know what we really want to look at is what's the impact, you know. And so this is a um, a study that has an official protocol that's approved with the um, National Security Institute in Mexico. And and what we're trying to do is prove out a concept. It's how do you implement an effective program that incorporates mobile technology um, to achieve our health outcomes for patients that are dealing with chronic disease such as diabetes. I want to take a switch now, um, move across the world to Spain, where we're doing a color program <coughs> with um, the Spanish Red Cross and the Vodafone Spain Foundation. And these projects are targeting elderly people and people with intellectual disabilities. So first, the project with, um, that targets elderly people is really trying to look at the challenge that exists in a lot of um, the the developed countries, as Rob mentioned, we're all you know, getting older and, and having to demand a lot of healthcare services. So, so the Spanish government is particularly interested in how you keep people living at home independently longer um, because if they have to go to a nursing home facility type situation, that, that increases the cost and the burden, um, the tax burden on um, the population. So that's the need. A lot of the, the elderly group that we were specifically targeting were women that did not have family members living in town. Um, so they were they were more isolated than, than usual. And what we wanted to do was see what we did was we built upon a program that the Spanish Red Cross had already been implemented called Teleassistance. And Teleassistance was about calling elderly people, having an interaction with them on a weekly basis, establishing a relationship, but it was just by phone. What we wanted to do is take that to the next level and do a video uh, phone call with them. Now, many of you probably access Skype and, and use your laptops just fine, but that can be very daunting for other people to give them a laptop and expect them to be able to use <coughs> Skype. I honestly have issues with it whenever I try to use it. So we created a system working very closely that was very easy to use. Another issue working with elderly, the elderly community is, 
you know, they're resistant to change. They're, they're proud. They don't want to admit that they need assistance um, before, before it's too before long. So um, what was really important to them was to give them something that didn't seem like a huge intervention. You know, um, in order to get internet access into a lot of people's homes that live in high rises, it's got a lot of drilling, it's a lot of, um, it's, you have to get permits for the <coughs> high rise that you live in to get a cable and drill it through everywhere. But actually, with mobile technology, you can buy a modem off the shelf in the Vodafone store and pretty simply get online. So we use that wireless capability and built a system that actually incorporated a, a technology piece that was already very familiar to elderly groups, and that was their television set. The television set was actually a very key component to their livelihoods, and we were able to build the system using the television set as the video, um, the means for them to do, see the Red Cross therapist or the video. So the keys were, the key were, the key, was to make it easy to use and easy to implement. And, uh, and we found a big difference. It's, um, it's a lot harder to hide behind um, a video call than it is a, a phone call if you're not feeling well. Um, we also found that we played with, um, that we had positive outcomes from, from vanity because if they knew that they were going to be getting on a video call, it's a lot different than just getting ready. And in, you know, we found that people that hadn't shaved in a week were shaving. People that had, didn't have a reason to get ready to go out were getting ready, and that is important when you're dealing with a, a population that is lonely and depressed. So um, it's just another idea of how you can use technology and uh, the ability to access data wirelessly. Um, I want to get into one of our more recent programs. This time project that deals with people with um, intellectual disabilities. So this is something that we just announced in February. And if you see that picture of the printer, um, I'll explain. So we have a new technology out there called augmented reality. You may or may not have heard about it, but there's going to be more applications on smartphones available using augmented reality today. So well, how augmented reality works is you can imagine using your camera, your smartphone, your tablet as a viewfinder, and what it does is it, put, it superimposes a digital layer of content over a physical thing. So, for example, you could find yourself traveling to Korea, and you're lost, and if you had this augmented reality app, trying to read a sign, you can put your viewfinder over the sign and your augmented reality app will translate the Korean to English. So that's just an example. So in this project, what we did is we're creating a series of apps and they're designed to help um, people with intellectual disabilities to retain jobs. Um, and we're working in partnership with the government that's really interested in going and, and having successful careers for them. And with that printer, if you had a problem with it, or even if you were just learning how to use it, instead of just having a manual, paper manual that you had to thumb through and figure out, you would have an augmented reality app, and you could just put it, you know, show, show the printer, and then your instructions would come up, and it would indicate, okay, well, open this drawer if you have a paper jam, um, press this button to boot it back up again, and so that's that's how we're working on this project to and how we're using mobile to help people. So I have one more example to share with you today, and this is a project that is taking place in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, I'm not sure if any of you have traveled there, uh, but mountains and big areas that are Native American reservations with very sparsely populated communities. And what we're trying to, to help here is, is remote connectivity 
um, and dealing specifically with patients that are suffering from congestive heart failure. So according to the federal government, 25 to 50 percent of congestive heart failure patients are re-hospitalized within three to six months of hospital discharge. Um, and this is something that they seriously want to um, improve because of the burden on Medicaid and Medicare. Um, and if you are familiar with the CHF, you know, one of the things that you need to keep a good eye a few things that you need to keep a good eye on are your weight fluctuations, your blood pressure um, fluctuations also. And what we've done in this project is work together with Flagstaff Medical Center and the National Institutes of Health Public-Private Partnership um, Office, Verizon, Zephyr, a, uh, a medical device, mobile device uh, company, and uh, not the GSMA development plan. Um, basically, we've gotten these devices, they're blood pressure cuffs and weight scales and SPO2 meters. They're all Bluetooth enabled, and they can speak through the cell phones that we've provided in the project wirelessly and upload the data of the patient so that that, that information gets sent to their care providers at um, Flagstaff Medical Center. Um, that way, similar to the Lutheran Wireless Tijuana project, they can see when people are fluctuating and they need to get more assistance. Now, a lot of the folks that are actually going to be in this project don't even live under a cellular network um, because it's that remote of the land in Arizona. But it's still helpful for them to be able to use the devices at home and then their child or even they can do this if they're well enough. They can drive to the nearest main road. Once they get into that cellular network, the cell phone uploads the data automatically. So we're hoping that what we can do is re reduce that readmission rate, and what that gets into is providing an incentive for governments and for um, companies to, to get involved because that's going to be um, a real money saver. So that kind of ends the part where I'm talking about examples. What I wanted to also do for, for this presentation is talk about some of the project criteria because I think it's applicable to the, to the activities that you're going to be doing today as you think about you know, the Alliance Healthcare Foundation um, funds and, um, and how to develop projects and what we've found, frankly, to be successful. So we've talked about some of this already before, but again, it must be meet a community need. We've got tons of projects, over almost 20 projects that are specifically healthcare related. They're all really different because the communities that we're working in are very different. Um, that said, you know, take from what's been done out there already and learn from it because there are things that you can take um, as lessons learned so that you don't have to. Um, Less than the hard way of somebody already has. Um, you know, our project must involve partners. We can't do it ourselves. Like, Qualcomm, we don't know how to do this. We need to work with the nonprofit community um, that they manage and implement the projects on the ground. They're the ones that understand the communities the best. And then all the other partners bring something to the table. And what's important is when they're bringing something, something to the table, that, that makes sure that they have skin in the game. And we found that that's, that's very useful. It's like no, no partner should really just be getting paid to do this project. They should also, maybe they, maybe we do provide funding to say a software developer, developer, but we also expect them to provide any kind of donation or something to the project. Um, we find that it's very useful to be in line with government goals for the, for the community. What policies are you um, mirroring or supplementing? And um, there, there are definitely programs that are available that may provide extra funding, that just provide extra support because you are um, addressing something that the government has deemed important. For us, you know, it must demonstrate Qualcomm technology that and how technology can improve people's 
guys. So it's about finding out you know, who your partners, who you're going to partner with, what's important for them, and sticking to that while you while you together try to attack a problem. And that, I mean, that leads into creating a win situation for all organizations and beneficiaries in, in your programs. That's, that's paramount because you can't, um, you can't do something without remembering the interests of everybody involved and, and otherwise, you know, nobody's, their skin is not going to be the same as that. And then we definitely look for ideas that are scalable and sustainable on their own for after two years. So this gets into what Nancy was talking about. It's like, what is the underlying business model? Once you've done this, what is going to make it succeed on its own um, once you're ready to walk away? Because eventually, you're going to need to to let it let it do what it um, what it can on its own. And, and that entails really looking at the costs. For example, what is the cost of this new intervention that you're going to put in, and um, how does that compare to the paradigm that exists already, and then also the benefit. Okay, so you put in this expensive system, is there an equal benefit that, that merits the cost? Can you make the argument? So that, that is also really important. So, important for, for this, these programs and, and for your organizations also. And then that, that basically wraps up what I wanted to share with you today. And um, I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, and if I may leave you with a piece of advice, um, and that's just to um, be flexible and very patient. Um, if you're really doing something innovative, it's not going to be easy. Um, and we found that, right? <laughs> and, um, you know, communicate frequently. If you're always talking, then you'll be able to make sure that all your partners are, are uh, their, their needs are being addressed, and then you can work together more to, to achieve your goals. Thank you. So um, let me think about, let me talk about Spain a little bit. One measure of sustainability and success for the project with the elderly um, is that the Spanish government has latched onto it. They loved um, what they saw and they are working now with the Red Cross on their own to expand the project into other places. When we did it, we were just looking at Madrid um, and, a, and a group of 100 patients, and they have since taken it and invested in it so that it is being expanded in Catalonia and a few other regions in Spain. Um, with our um, project in Arizona, what we're seeing, it's, it's still very much in progress, but what we're seeing is the um, now the Flagstaff Medical is working on its own with Zephyr to make sure that we've got the project going, but um, as we've learned, there's, there's there's improvements that can be made to the system. So they're off on their own, making improvements to the system, and they're they're making um, they're having the conversations necessary to start socializing the concept for more internal investment from FM, off, off of the FMC's part. So we've got. Um, some good feelings about the, the ability of this project to live on past Qualcomm's investment. Yes? Would you be able to tell us a little bit about the community? 
um, in San Diego specifically. Um, so Qualcomm has two areas where we do investments in the community. Um, one is our community giving area, and that area is very separate to this department. And we actually do not, um, wireless reach is, is very much intended to be an international program within Qualcomm. So for our community giving, we invested in healthcare, education, and arts and culture. And um, I, I can't give you the details about those projects, but I can definitely direct you to the people that can. Um, thank you so much. to introduce our keynote speaker of the event. Um, Professor Gary Manchufico is Associate Dean of Fully Employed and Executive Programs at Pepperdine University's Rosario School of Business and Management. He's learned the techniques for community dialogue directly from Peter Block, so you all uh, received a, a ticket at the beginning of the event, and that's for a raffle for Peter Block's book, which is called The Abundant Community. And that book will be handed out at the end of the event. So, as Associate Dean, Professor Andrew Vico oversees a variety of programs, including the Executive MBA, the Presidential and Key Executive MBA, and a number of others. Dr. Andrew Vico has taught at Pepperdine's Rosario School since 2003, and he also brings more than 20 years of experience leading strategic development, operations management, and integration and turnaround operations in solving complex challenges as a CEO, COO, and also as a general management executive for both startups and Fortune 50 companies. Dr. Mandy Fico has also served in a variety of capacities in social and community endeavors, most recently as Chief Executive Officer of Los Angeles University Preschool, an independent public benefit corporation working to make voluntary, high-quality preschool available to every four-year-old in Los Angeles County, regardless of their family's income. His work includes community building and change, including development services for underprivileged and high-risk youth services, community-based senior programs, and drug and alcohol prevention programs. Dr. Manju Fico holds a BA and MA in psychology from Chapman University, and a PhD in organizational psychology from the California School of Professional Psychology. He is an active member of the Academy, Academy of Management, the American Psychological Association, and the American College of Healthcare Executives. It's our pleasure to have him here with us today. He will, he will be delivering our event's keynote speech on effective community dialogue, which will be followed by interactive workshops where you will gain hands-on knowledge in creating community collaborations for social change. So welcome, Professor Manchin. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. There we go. Well, I'm delighted to be here uh, and uh, get a chance to uh, speak with you and so forth. I'm probably going to end up moving this thing and carrying it with me because I, I don't do well behind the podium and uh, I, I really admire the ability to sit through what's now your fourth head up here uh, so far this morning. So, I think if we move around a little bit, we might get uh, a little additional energy. Anyway, I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm just amazed at the technologies that have been talked about. Um, you know, even, even watching the PowerPoint this morning, you know, they say an expert is somebody from out of state with, uh, uh, you know, with advanced competency in technology. I brought a PowerPoint, and I'm a local Southern California person. But hopefully. Uh, I still cannot be something in the way of understanding the shift into community dialogue as uh, we go forward this morning. Because it is a significant shift that's happening and one that I think is uh, important. But the interesting thing to me about community dialogue, especially when you look against the backdrop of all these technologies, which absolutely are incredible and amazing, um, is uh, the, the fact that we're really talking almost like going back to the future. 
know, the critical issue, if you will, around community health is the central feature of our community, the central feature of neighborhood. Um, we have become so mobile, and we have become so, um, you know, reconstructed as as communities. But most people don't actually know their neighbors. You know, most people have not participated in a block barbecue. Uh, you know, things that you know, 30, 40 years ago we just sort of took for granted. And so it's kind of hard to effectively create change without the relationship that's necessary in order to, to bring change about. So part of what I want to talk about a little bit is uh, shifting our consciousness, if you will, to looking differently at the issue of, of community and community-based health, not just being something about what experts do to the community, but actually about engaging the community themselves in their own uh, solutions, if you will. Again, the technologies are great, but I think one of the disadvantages of technology is that they sometimes interfere with the very thing we want to have, and that is dialogue. That is a conversation. I'll give you a great example that got brought home to me very recently. And that is, uh, uh, we went out to dinner, and it was for my uh, granddaughter's birthday. Uh, uh, at the right age of 10, her parents decided she needed an iPhone. So, I don't know how many of you have children or grandchildren around that age, but if you give them a device that will allow them to text, it suddenly becomes an obsession. And so we're out to dinner, and she's, you know, like going to town with her iPhone and so forth, and, uh, texting her friends. It happened to be a community night as well in our town. And she's, you know, texting away. And so, you know, I'm sitting there, and I'm kind of feeling a little frustrated, you know, and I'm kind of feeling very paternalistic, like you shouldn't have bought her an iPhone from that age, and all this kind of stuff. And so, when it hit me, I had an iPhone in my own pocket. So I took out my iPhone, put out a little text thing, and text her, how are you doing? Love, Grandma. <laughs> All of a sudden, across the table, she lifts her head, smiles, and so forth. I said, I knew you were there. I knew you were there. So technology is great until it begins to interfere with the ability to actually have a conversation and dialogue with the very people we're trying to work with. So, if we begin to think differently, we, we want to begin to ask ourselves, what might be different? Because, if you will, we can't maintain the same approaches, the same mental models, if you will, and begin to come up with new solutions. It, it just isn't going really to happen. And what we're seeing is that growing demand for inter-organizational collaboration is critical <coughs> to problem-solving issues that address. You know, we are now you know, in 2012, we have been working with many of the same issues for decades. You know, we've been involved in many of the same challenges for decades. Patient compliance is nothing new. Prior to uh, starting my Encore career as an academician and going into university life, I worked in healthcare. I was in healthcare for over 20 some odd years. Uh, everything from my original practice of you know, starting as a clinician to becoming a hospital administrator running healthcare companies and patient clients. We've been talking about that for you know 30 some odd years that I can remember. That we're still talking about it today. And so the question becomes how do we begin to make a shift? If we look at this chart here, what it is, and it's kind of a little fuzzy, but what it is is showing, if you will, the poverty rates. And it's taking a look at poverty rates from 1960 to 2009, and you notice not much has changed. Now, we have worked on poverty diligently in this country during those same, if you will, 50 years. Not much has changed. And so when we begin to examine this, what we see is that we have a lot of experts coming up with a lot of solutions to a lot of problems, but often what we don't do is actually engage the community itself and get the community involved in the solution to its own particular issues. And that's a bit of what I want to talk about. Um, and uh, discuss with you today and also bring, if you will, the, the thinking of my, uh, one of my mentors, Peter Block, and his associate, John McKnight, to the present. So how do we begin to do this is to explore the dynamics, if you will, and techniques associated with starting to work through real collaboration. Collaboration that means that we, it, we, we begin to blur the boundaries between organizations, we begin to blur the boundaries between efforts, we begin to blur the boundaries between measurements so that we begin to think a little bit differently 
how collective resources can make a shift that um, single-handedly we cannot. So today is about strengthening the dialogue amongst you in this room. It's not about coming up with the solutions or the design for natural community collaborative. I don't know you well enough, I don't know your community well enough, and so forth. And what we don't want to get into is a lot of opinions. What we can do today is strengthen the relationships with the people in this room so that in follow-on meetings that I trust that you'll be having and so forth, you'll be able to work for the coming together of joint ownership of collective responsibility for resolving things. So community-based collaboration is, is kind of a unique solution. And at the core of it is this joint ownership and collective responsibility. Today, as I take you through some of the dialogues that we're going to have, you know, if you don't feel a little uncomfortable, then we're probably not pushing the envelope well enough. And I realized that when we talked about making a shift um, and the advantages of collaboration, that it also requires the uh, faith. Um, I, I left the corporate world and um, moved into activity, but I also launched a nonprofit about six years ago. And we had some folks, we had some seed capital and so forth, and we had uh, a great idea. We thought that if we could reach in and help every four-year-old in Los Angeles County get access to preschool education just one year, then we would do a lot of things. One, primarily, we would get kids more equally prepared to take advantage of the school system that is available to them as opposed to them starting school from behind. But we would also be able to create the school itself as a hub in the community able to take that hub and be able to reach families and be able to address a variety of issues, health of course being one of them, family issues being another, family dynamics, etc. Now, we set out very traditionally, like most people do, business planning, strategic planning, strategic visioning, what are our goals, what are our objectives, and so forth, and very quickly came to realize that we weren't going to get very far very quickly. So we sort of said, what if we didn't do all that? What if we just had a goal? And what if we just set up a bunch of community conversations and we started saying amongst ourselves and with the communities in which we want to work, what needs to happen? And of course, people start to talk about access, and then people start talking about the economy, and then people start talking about how dense the neighborhood was, and they couldn't get a building to set up a preschool if they wanted to. And then people talk about availability of their you know, little you know, room in the back of a church or something. And then people talked about how that church is so old and has asbestos and so on and so forth. And so through each of those dialogues, we began, we began mapping even further and further all the people who needed to be involved in this conversation. Now, Los Angeles County is 4,000 square miles. It's a huge county. A lot, a lot of people. And the question again, how are we even going to conceivably begin to do this? So we started to feel overwhelmed very, very quickly. And, Certainly, we're a long ways from that goal. But what I am pleased to say is that when we launched at the end of 2004, that by 2010, about five and a half years later, we had over 350 preschool programs and 50,000 children being served. Most of those schools were schools we built as a collective and so forth. And we turned most of those schools over to the ownership of the local neighborhood, but those neighborhoods ran those schools, those neighborhoods became invested in those schools surviving. Those schools generated jobs for those communities, and those jobs created opportunity for many parents and so forth, and we also were able to then network with a variety of resources to, to get involved with servicing the families and the children and so forth. And the first major research study that came out by an independent university that evaluated and showed that these kids, these particular programs that we designed and were developing, actually exceeded the performance of their peers who were going to state preschool or involved in Head Start programs. Now, I think that's amazing. This was an amazing group of people who came together to make this happen. Now, we weren't any smarter than state preschool folks, and we're not any smarter than Head Start folks. What we did, however, was get rid of a lot of bureaucracy. We got rid of a lot of rules about how you're supposed to do things and got people together based on their desire and commitment to want to do something and then said, how do we support that? And so every new rule that we considered for implementation, every new rule for monitoring, every new rule 
or a measurement, you know, looking at the ROI and so forth, we have a central question. How is that going to help the teacher with that child? And if you couldn't connect that message or that rule to that central core element, then it probably wasn't something that we really needed in order to achieve our goal, our vision, our mission. But you can imagine to do that meant to fly in the face of a lot of folks, a lot of politicians, a lot of people who said, but you can't do it that way. The only thing that allowed us to persevere, I believe, to this day, is the fact that we developed relationships with each other. We had each other's backs. We began to figure out when we needed to stand up and challenge certain assumptions and so forth and strengthen our ability. So what I believe collaboration does is it helps you address complex problems much more effectively because you have more perspectives in the room, if you will. It brings together a variety of people looking at a variety of things from, from a broader viewpoint, if you will. So it brings a broader capacity already to implement the solution. So while we were known as Los Angeles University Preschool at LA Bob, we didn't define ourselves that way. We defined ourselves as a network. You know? And anybody that's a part of the network and wants to be a part of the network could be. Everybody was welcome at the table. Everybody's welcome to participate in the conversations and so forth. Now, it wasn't just a free-for-all. Certainly, we had structure and so on and so forth. But it's core and central to it was this notion that everybody was important, everybody's contribution was important, and everybody's ability to participate in the dialogue was necessary to get to the final solution. So when the question is asked, how can nonprofits collaborate on part of community problems or challenges, you need to also ask what might facilitate a broader solution. Current funding streams I would offer don't do this. One of the biggest challenges with government funding various kinds of funding streams is they you know this issue of accountability. Now the problem with most of the designs of accountability systems is they're actually set out to police the good works and good efforts of people who are trying to deliver services. They're not set out to you know make them shine. So you know we need to look at all the various expenses and should we bought a birthday cake and we charge them to the funding and should we get really fit that category funding. Etc. Etc. And so the, 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 the governmental and most funding stream systems actually reinforce the silo. So most nonprofits are actually set up not to collaborate. Most of them are set up with accountability systems to prove their worth. And so they become myopic and they become very you know singular in their focus and efforts to be able to measure it. Because we say if it can't be measured, then it's probably not worthwhile. Well, that's not true. Human interaction is not a system. And human interaction does not readily lend itself to the convenience of all the measurement systems that we currently know. Human interaction is messy. It's, it's kind of confusing. It's kind of chaotic at times and so forth. But it's where the most potential exists for having the most impact. Now, I'm not saying you don't measure stuff, but measurement should be a tool for helping us understand the route as opposed to a, a system of determining who gets what and how we're going to ration resources and reward people who can prove things and not reward people who can't prove things. Most things that have been extraordinary and revolutionary and truly innovative, if you will, did not come from a logical plan. It came from somebody singing in the shower or driving down the street you know, or having an accident or being frustrated over something. It came from the affective world, not the logical, rational world, if you will. And so it's not that I'm encouraging that we just throw all things aside. What I'm saying is how could we begin to look at a different way of creating foresight other than our traditional systems? Because our traditional systems call for segmentation and fracture. And as we all know, in the delivery of health care, it is that fracture that has caused most of the deliveries. We have long talked about the fact that compliance in healthcare, in part, is attributed to, you know, we can say some of it's attributed to age, and it is, but it's also attributed to fractured families. It's also attributed to depression. It's also attributed to when we put in certain diagnostic categories and we only reimburse for the medical illness if the psychoemotional illness isn't addressed, the person's too depressed to take their medicines, or whatever the case is, and this fraction actually, you know, counterbeams or works against the very efforts we're trying to do in terms of treating the 
So what if we knew a different way of leading into the future and we took a risk at that? This is one of my favorite examples of, of such a, a question of what if we knew a different way and what would that call on us? This is a town you may recognize, or you may not. It's uh, a few hundred years old, you know, actually several hundred years old. Um, it's in Europe. And it was a town that maybe, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago, so it was just dying on the vine. Blighted, there were, there were businesses had left the town, there wasn't a whole lot going on there. Uh, services had dwindled, the tax base had dwindled, etc. The city leaders and city founders were saying, you know, we have got problems. We can't even begin to address all the social issues because we just don't have the money, we just don't have the tax base to be able to do that and so forth. And so health services were declining, among other services, education was declining. Um, sound familiar? Certainly, you know, you talk to some communities, and this is how they're feeling you know, today in 2012 uh, in California, not just in California. Anyway, so this, this particular town had a very wise city council, if you will. And they said, I know, let's get some experts to help us. Let's go outside our system, let's call in some consultants and have those consultants evaluate our situation and tell us what we should do or help us understand what we should do to solve our dilemma, to figure out how we should go forward into the future. And so they did. They went out and they hired a lot of the big major consulting firms. And they sent in a lot of their you know, little MBA teams and so forth and came together and they, they evaluated the system and they evaluated what they did. Now this is a, a town that for centuries worked on manufacturing. And in that manufacturing had been very, very successful because they're on a river. But manufacturing had disappeared, so now they weren't successful today. So the, the, they got these consultants, the consultants came in, they studied them, and they said, well, listen, I right know, let's just understand your core competencies. What are your, your core competencies? What have you been doing that you're really good at? Let's make sure you do more of that and so forth. So guess what they ended up recommending at the end of the day? You should do more manufacturing. You know? Now the people here, and the city council said, well, wait a minute, that's what we've been doing, and it's not working. So they became very bold, and they decided to take a leap of faith. Someone else had a harebrained idea that they decided to explore. They went out and spent $150 million hiring this crazy architect out of California who came in and built a museum that looks like a spaceship that landed in the middle of Bilbao, Spain, which is in the countryside in the northwest corner of Spain. And then they struck a $50 million deal with the Guggenheim to bring in the artworks and so forth. And they took this centuries old manufacturing town and they completely reinvented it. It is now a destination spot. Tourism is great. Not only is tourism great for this particular Spain, uh, uh, this particular town, uh, aficionados of Frank Gehry, who's the architect that they hired. Uh, go there, but it's now become a major destination for people who live in art and travel and culture and that sort of thing. Um, but it's also very close to the northwest corner of Spain, so it's revitalized tourism along the coast of northwest Spain. It's an amazing story when you think about it. But what did it require? I believe that one of the things it required is for people to be bold. People to be bold and people to be committed to doing something different, to, to develop a stewardship for people. A stewardship for people in place. If you will, know, that's all we did with LA Apples. We, we didn't set out to design the best, most perfect universal preschool system. That's, there's never going to be enough money for that. What we could do, however, was be bold and try and commit to the very thing we always talked about. So when Rob and uh, Nancy and folks earlier were saying that the solutions are in this room, they're in this room if the dialogues take place in this room. And people are bold enough to have those dialogues to begin to shift from the me and mine of how we operate most organizations and how funding is organized to more of a we and ours. But the question, of course, is that in order to do this, what will it take? What well, takes a sense of relatedness, but beyond a sense of relatedness, 
I'm not going to let there's three other core elements to create collaborative innovation for change. Uh, the first one being relationships. I'll get back to that in just a moment. The process for innovation and change needs to be developed by uh, the people that are involved. And then thirdly, there's the subject matter expertise. Now the third part we generally have down pretty well. In fact, that's how we design most of our organizations. Is we develop a subject matter expertise. It's very content specific, usually, and we deal with uh, diabetes, or we deal with uh, Alzheimer's, or we deal with heart disease, or we do, you know, and so we get very specific in our content issues. But as we know, again, health is holistic. You know, if one part of a person's health is damaged, then we can see the ramifications and implications elsewhere. So how do we design and develop content issues, but ones that are flexible, ones that allow collaboratives to come together and have multiple perspective, perspectives that, that begin to put you in a position to be able to deal with the whole person. However, even if you're successful in that, and a lot of groups are, a lot of communities have already done that. They've pulled together multiple organizations and so forth. Most change initiatives have done that, whether it's in the private sector, public sector, nonprofit, or for profits, and so forth. But information alone is not sufficient to change behavior. Information alone is not sufficient to change behavior. We'd like to think it is, but people are not rational at the end of the day. We're emotional. We're social. We don't just operate in our brain. We operate as a whole, if you will. And the central feature of that is relationship, is relatedness, if you will. And then, when we go to change, we're concerned about the change. So change isn't something that we just jump on. It isn't just something we do because of why not, and so forth. In fact, most of us are resistant to change unless we're confident that the new state or the new way of being will hold no threat for us. If there's any fear that the new state of change will create some kind of threat, we will resist it. Now, just to give you an example, you know what a merger and acquisition is, right? And together, they merge, or one big company acquires another company, and so forth. They happen all the time, and so forth. Companies do this as a way of leveraging themselves and building themselves, and so forth. It's estimated by research that over 80% of mergers and acquisitions fail to achieve the original synergies that were in the prospectus that was developed about them. In fact, they, they, most companies that are publicly traded actually see their value go down after the merger and acquisition. They said a lot of brilliant people, either chiefs of the, and captains of industry organizing these kinds of deals and so forth. How could it go so wrong? 85, I think, is the number that a lot of research sites around the neighborhood of 85% of enterprise wide information technology initiatives fail to achieve the original goals that they were set out to achieve. Again, these are brilliant people. How does this happen? How does this not happen? I would offer is that they got the subject matter down, but failed to consider the change process, the culture in which these things were going to be introduced to, and so forth. And the relationships or lack of relatedness. You take two organizations and you put them together, it can pencil out just fine on paper. But what doesn't pencil out so quickly on paper is the cultural merger that's taking place. How people operate, how people prefer to operate, how people like the way that they do things. So we're, we struggle with gaining those synergies that were originally promised. I think the compliance issue that I was talking about earlier is, is a great example of just this. But we know that there's an alternative way of doing things, an alternative way of creating this leading and relational influence, this innovation and change process, and that is building community and community dialogue. And this is what we were trying to talk about. Is this bringing our authentic selves, if you will, uh, to the table to have a conversation differently than we had before, so that we change the story, we change the narrative about who we are and why we're here. And we, we talk about the authentic self because of the fact that we're talking about leadership. Warren Bennis has shared with us in, in his extensive writings on leadership development, that becoming an effective leader is about becoming more of yourself. 
It's just that simple. It's just a challenge. Who are you? How do you show up in a group? How do you engage others? How do you get others invested and believe? This is not related. This is so important. It's where the source of influence is. There's different levels of influence. There is uh, certainly authority. The level of influence of reward will give people rewards and then they'll give them money. Or they will you know, do what we ask them to. Or we'll threaten them with all the resources. So there's adverse or consequences and so forth that come into play. Um, so there's a variety of ways that we can use power to achieve the goals we want to achieve. But the most sustainable, when we talk about sustainable organizations or sustainable uh, efforts and so forth, the most significant ones are ones where the meaning of that organization has become personal, and the relationships within that organization have become significant and personal, and the influence of that organization on people has resulted from relationships and the influence that comes out of relationships. I'll give you a quick test to kind of prove my point. How many of you can name the last six Nobel Prize winners for physics? Okay, how about the last six Pulitzer Prize winners for drama? Okay, well, let's get a little bit more pop culture. How about this last six Best Director Awards for movies? Being the smartest, having the most expertise, being the most talented, doesn't guarantee you to be remembered. But if I ask you, who was the teacher that had the biggest impact in your life? Who was the relative that had the biggest impact in your life? Etc. Suddenly, Names would come to mind immediately because you had a relationship with these people. There was a common platform on which you decided to relate and it created meaning for you. And their ability to influence you was meaningful. Now, sometimes people reach such significant meta proportions of relationship that they do influence us. Martin Luther King, Gandhi, various sorts of, uh, uh, Mother Teresa, you know, various sorts of folks have reached that. Unfortunately, by the time you become an icon, and have that kind of proportion, you know, you're, you're dead. You know? That's a little way to try to get your community involved and active and so forth. You know, so what you can do is begin to alter and shift that. And it goes to the point of creating if you will, a new narrative, an alternative narrative. We run around now saying there's not enough time. I would offer there's always going to be enough time. We just have to slow down. I don't have time to do this, I don't have time to do that, and so on and so forth. Well, then the question is, what's the choice you're making about how you're showing up? What needs to shift if you will? What if we didn't know all the answers? What if we didn't have to know the outcome before we put in the application? What if we could begin an exploration? What if we could trade some, some chances, if you will? How many of you know the story of post notes? Korean? You know those little One of the most successful products ever launched was an accident. The inventors of post notes actually invented a glue that the company couldn't use. And so, in the effort to try to do something else with that glue, they figured out it had people with papers. So, it was an accident. It was not the purposeful plan, logical model set forth that created that success. And so, forth. so, what if mystery was an opportunity for us, as opposed to an anxiety for us? What if we Value of reflection. Let's sit down and think about what we're doing. You know, as opposed to visiting and productive show, you know, um, the benefit of, of why we do it. What if relationship became our measurement of whether or not we had a true community based initiative? How many relationships, authentic relationships, we could measure, if you will? And what if we believe that people showed up in generosity? as opposed to trying to get away with something. Major, major funding source. I happened to go to dinner with the executive director of this particular organization one time. Or actually, just lunch. And while we're at this, she began to tell me about her personal history and stuff that she's done. And, and she was over housing at one point in time, I won't say where, or anything like that. And, and she was very proud of the fact that very few people perpetrated fraud. Like one of the main things she talked about in 
this new set of reaction materials. And, and it got me to think, well, why don't we just assume we'll be able to do that? And instead of putting all our energy into that, we put our energy into something else. Instead of policing people, what if we supported people? Yeah, you know, I think people like the way they think, whatever. But what if we believe people really showed about generous, willing, motivated, eating? I seriously doubt poor people get up in the morning and say, gee, I don't have anything better to do today. I think I'll commit fraud. They have the same desires, energies, wonders, hungers, and so forth that any of us do. So what if we shifted our thinking that instead of the haves determining for the have-nots, that the haves actually engage the have-nots in the discussion and the solution of what would work for them? That may or may not be involved in policing that historically has been done. So, what if we just created new narratives? That's the bottom line, if you will. Just to give you a quote from Peter Block, I don't know if you can read it to you, it's actually on the back of the program here. But I, it's something Peter says in almost every meeting I've ever been in with him. He says, you know, the social fabric is created one room at a time. <laughs> one room at a time. When people come together in that moment. So, we're talking about common good and changing the narrative to that sense of the common good. And what this new narrative is, is it says we're going to favor the primacy of people over the primacy of being correct and compliant. It's an interesting shift if you will. So it calls for relationships. And relationships become critical and important because we are relational animals by nature. If you will, we grow in, we go through, we go towards relationships and so forth. And relationships are the promise of intimacy. Why? Because, as I mentioned a moment ago, you could recall that parent or that relative or that teacher and so forth. If you will, we act upon that in whom we care about. We act upon that in whom we care about. How many, if I told you that in your local neighborhood, you had the junior high school, a kid showed up, school and shot two other kids. And it's, it's right in your neighborhood and your kid goes to that school. How many of you would be concerned? How many of you would take action? How many of you would say that is really serious? It needs to be done. Well, it happened very recently in the town of Linda. It's not that it wasn't as meaningful now to you as it would be if it was in your own neighborhood, but we act on that which is closest to us, that which is most meaningful to us. And so the challenge becomes how do we foster that relationship? Simply having and creating information is not enough. We have to create community. Community is where people become engaged together, if you will, something meaningful. Now, there are two principles of relational influence that we always have to try to achieve. And that is that every community and organization change is preceded by a personal one. Meaning, unless there's a difference in the dialogue in this room today, there will not be a difference in the way we collaborate after today. Because right? any organization should come to things preceded by a personal one. And relational influence that touches people's human being, who they are, is what is the most powerful form of influence make things move forward. So it also means that when we change the narrative, if you will, we have to take time with each other. It's people who call the stakeholders. Time with each other it doesn't mean we hold just focus groups or we just have people in and listen to them and so forth. It means that we're engaged in relationships, acts of service, if you will. Ones that will develop trust. One of the things that I have that I've had the opportunity over my career being involved in Healthcare for as long as I have. I've talked to many doctor groups. I've talked to a lot of big companies, organizational psychologists, young physicians, and so forth, who talk about the issue of compliance and how that's just such a source of frustration for patient compliance. And I said, well, let me ask you this why should that patient trust you? Why should the patient trust that what you're prescribing them is worth them altering their life? Maybe it's a lifestyle they've had for 50 years. 
Maybe there's our habits that we've been doing a long time. What's the trust that you built in the relationship that is so meaningful now that when you suggest they do something differently, they should say, well, of course. Mary suggests this, so I should do it because Mary, I, I have confidence in and so forth, as opposed to you know, Dr. So and so. What's the investment in that trust that is taking place? Because it requires a sense of mutuality to gain influence in that place. And it starts with one very simple thing, and this is what we're going to do right now in the next few minutes. I realize we're so sort of pressed for time, and some of your biology is probably in and so forth about this point. But we want to start with building the community right here, right now. And every community building event starts with an invitation. It starts with, I am glad to see you, I am glad you're here. Tell me about who you are and why you showed up today. So I'm actually going to ask you to do that. I'm going to ask you in just a moment, when I say go, to break into groups of three, and we're going to have a conversation. Um, We're going to have a conversation of hospitality and invitation. Now, I went you in groups of three. Now, one of the reasons you want to be in groups of three is that because if you're only in the diet, if you're only in two, one person can dominate, and or if one person tends to not want to do the exercise, they can exert a bunch of influence on the other person. It's harder to cheat when you're in threes. Right? So I want you in groups of threes to do this exercise. Uh, now, I want you to be close to each other, so don't try to create intimacy from across the table. You're actually going to have to move some kind of proximity. And one way to sort of measure that proximity is whether or not your knees are any further than nine inches apart. If your knees are further than nine inches apart, you're going to have barriers in between you. So that means some configuring and moving around and so forth. And then once you're in that group uh, of three, pick people you don't know. That makes it a little easier to get started. I want you to welcome each other to the conversation today. Find out from the other two partners what brought them here today and share what the meaning of development and collaboration really is to you. Not a right answer, just what the meaning of it is for you. Okay? So let's do that now. We'll do that for about 10 minutes. So break into those groups of three. Grab your partners. Don't wait to be chosen. Okay. And make sure that the people next to you feel welcome to be here today. Welcome. Yeah, face to the pants. Face. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get some view of your camera. Like, like hands of talking heads. Oh, no. Stop it? Oh, yeah. Huh? Can you stop it? Okay. I'll stop mine. You have on 60? What's that? You have on 60. You can get this cancer with 60. Yeah. No. The new fire, the Mark 3 can, though. Okay, now I know it. <laughs> One of the changes, they pretty much combine the 7 d and the 5 d
Okay, take just a couple more minutes to wrap it up. back to the larger group for a moment. See, this is part of the exchange, so that's a good sign. So, let me ask you, what struck you? about the conversation we just had. We have someone over here. We have a microphone coming over there. Just how intimate the communication. How intimate and how how intimate and how quickly it can happen. What else? I learned Yes, I learned some things that are ongoing, happening right now, that I didn't know about. And so we learned something, right? What else struck you about the conversation? Well, one of them, I learned that if it's not fun and authentic, I ain't playing. <laughs> and uh, so how immediate trust can be built. Uh, when everybody gets a chance to talk, to share, and to feel their connectedness with each other just in threes right now. Absolutely. And, and part of what happened there, this is what you said, I'm quickly trusting the adult, is what we did in those few minutes was we made sure everybody's voice entered the room. Everyone had an invitation to be here, and everyone's voice entered the room. It's a critical part of a collaborative that everybody is, is in the room and is present. What else should I do over here? Um, how we all agreed at the table in the end that there was the need to make things work and how sad it was that nonprofits don't work more as a collaborative community. So we already begin to find common ground just in that brief conversation. Yes, sir. Uh, I feel like I can be a better doctor. I work in the emergency department. I see a lot of social problems and a lot of need that hasn't been recognized in social accommodations. So when I give the discharge instructions, I can actually direct them to the right direction and also help them out and find the resources they need. Yeah, right. So we can do what we do already, even better, by adding that intimate or relational element to it. What else struck you about the conversation? I just realized that my assumptions were kind of thrown out the window. I just kind of assumed everyone was here for the same reason I was. And all four of us, we kind of moved for us, we do not follow those, but um, <laughs> we were all here for very different reasons. And, but ultimately, we have the same goal. Right, now some of the girls, we found out that you and, and, and that's a, a really important point, because we use a lot of words like collaboration, and we think they all mean the same thing about them. So. So you get a chance to discover things that 
you assume now it becomes a new opportunity, a new dialogue we have, three more dialogues, four more dialogues, of diving deeper into what it means as to why you should be able to. Anything else that struck you about that conversation? Anyone share? Yes. As important as it was for me to speak, it was much more important for me to be heard, and I was heard. So it gave me a voice. It gave you a voice. Important to be heard. Yeah, I think that's you know that's such a significant part of uh, creating the relationship. You know, it's, it's, it, 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 it's an angel thing, right? The guy in the room is just trying to do the help, and how can he fix it? And he's uncomfortable. So she says, "I just want to be heard." He says, "What does that mean?" But it is important that when we have relationships, when we're in relationship to each other, that we show up and people not only have a chance to express, but they have a chance to be understood. And all that comes. Now look, we just broke into a conversation for a total of 10 minutes. Amongst a lot of folks who knew each other, but a lot of you don't know each other. And look how quickly we were able to shift the relatedness in this room. We're going to take a break now, but when we come back, we're going to further go through this conversation around collaboration and what it takes to create that community dialogue and so forth. But already, if you will, you've learned some things. You've learned a certain amount of commitment, and you've acted on the commitment to a new narrative, if you will. You've also seen who has the power to advocate, uh, how people showed up in the conversation you just had. You also had a chance to learn about yourself in the conversation you just had. For example, did you move immediately to get your partners? Did you wait to be chosen? Were you hesitant? Were you not sure? Were you confident? Probably your reaction in those few seconds after I said, okay, get together with two other people, reflects a lot about how you enter the relationships. Whether you're timid, whether you're assertive, and so forth. So there's a piece of personal learning that also shows up in how we take action with each other and so forth. But you also begin to learn who is in this community. If you are the collaborative, if you are the community to address these various sorts of health issues within the San, San Diego region, so if we're beginning to learn who each other is and what can be done. And that is the beginning. So let's take a break now, and then uh, about 15 minutes we'll come back and resume and further the dialogue. Thank you. Eleven fifteen right now, so we'll come back in fifteen minutes. 